The Breitling Slow Motion Super Ocean is an oddity. Try and say that five times. There's no other way to put it though. None of us were expecting this watch and I doubt many were asking for it. Just for clarification, this model has many different nicknames. The Slow Timer, the Slow Motion, the Slow Counter, the Minute Creeper. This is a model reaching back into the 1960s and creating a piece with a modern retro edge. At least that's how it's been described, modern retro. I am all for original designs and original ideas. That's what I want. That's what we all want from a watch brand. And looking where its inspiration comes from, it's really an exciting proposition. Does this piece line up with how Breitling conducts themselves today with the newly refreshed Navi Timer, which I am a big fan of, and the Top Time Collection that always injects some dynamism into their product line? Yes. This Super Ocean follows the correct theme. But how is it that Breitling has been able to take an original design, an original property that they own, it's truly theirs, and create something that looks kind of generic? I don't know. On the wrist today, the Omega Seamaster 300 1957 CK2913. This little watch is my weekend warrior, love wearing it. And it's a relevant watch for this video because the original Super Ocean was invented in 1957. These two watches share the same birthday. I think the 1957 reissue of the Super Ocean that the brand created a few years ago is still one of the coolest and most dynamic divers available. It's so good. Something of a spaceship flying saucer design that's period correct. It's truly 1950s in every single way. I love that these pieces are included on mesh bracelets. The size and proportion is fantastic. The way that the bezel curves inside like a plate. It's a machine from another time and deserves to be celebrated. And the Super Ocean as a modern diver has settled into a handful of excellent categories. The Heritage Collection with a blend of classic motifs, broad arrows, ceramic, shark mesh. It's a great looking watch, has a good reputation. Then to the modern Super Ocean, an all matte finished bezel and dial with a great balance of scale and proportions with applied batons and numerals. The dynamic case shape that flows around the dial and bezel. The sizes ranging all over the place from 44 millimeters to 36. And what's more important than anything else, value for money, great value for money. And I guess if we look at these watches, these three ranges that I've just covered, the Super Ocean Collection has always struggled with finding a grounding point. You know, something that truly defines it and its motifs, like the Seamaster and the Broad Arrow, like Panerai with the patented crown system. So for Breitling to suddenly cull the modern Super Ocean line and replace it with this modern retro model, it's perplexing. It's like they decided to fuse the Heritage Collection with the modern collection, gone is the Flying Bee, replaced with the traditional logo. And this could be seen for a time where the brand is wiping the slate and creating a ground for the Super Ocean to thrive. But to understand this variation, we have to look at the reference 2005 Slow Timer, which is an exceptionally interesting vintage dive watch. No kidding, it's a great piece. Depending on the model you're looking at, it has tons of quirks belonging to the 50s and the 60s. It has a skin diver quality. The 2005 references belonged in two categories, one of which comes across as more of an elegant Jeje Le Coutre inspired design. You know, it has a high contrast dial, a beautiful black and white composition, typical pencil hands with a dash, dot and triangle dial arrangement, no running seconds and a simple minute counting hand that clicks across the dial every interval for an hour. And it looks superb. Look at it. I have to give a big shout out to Cam over at Craft and Tailored for this excellent footage of this model. He's one of the only people on this platform to have ever covered the 2005 reference and done it so methodically. And the reason these models are called slow timers or slow motions is because the central hand doesn't sweep. It's used as a chronograph minute hand and it moves from one minute to the next along the white inner bezel. So it is difficult at the best of times to know if this watch is running or not. That's where the indicator at the six o'clock position comes into play, showing a full or a half full or an empty color swatch, depending on if the chronograph is running, stopped or reset. It's a very beneficial fail safe. Then you have a heavy duty reference 2005 with much thicker hands. It came a little bit later. Its dial is clustered with square and rectangular elements and it's an attractive looking watch, especially with that running sub dial on the left hand side. This design looks like something that belongs more on a Doxa or a Tudor Snowflake Submariner. And a funny piece of trivia is that this watch was promoted and advertised a lot as a regatta timer back in the day. You notice that their bezels communicated this point. But now to the elephant in the room. The reference 2005 is a diving chronograph. It's not just a dive watch with a dive bezel, it also has a chronograph function to help you time a stint. Now personally, I love diving chronos. I'm definitely in the minority when it comes to this. When it comes to dive watches, you know, the more the merrier with the tech used. The concept of starting a timer, jumping off the boat, using this chrono as your reference, as well as the bezel to time other smaller intervals, it's just great. 
And it needs to be said that there is so much elegance to be found in this category. Look at the JLC Deep Sea Chronograph. It's a thing of beauty. It's one of my grails. Now the thought of a modern super ocean, super being emphasized, also housing a chronograph movement in a watch like this would have been fantastic. Maybe it's just me, but the layout and the aesthetic of this watch suits the diving chrono configuration. Now what's happened is that the modern super ocean has used this reference 2005 as the core inspiration, but has stripped away all of the elements that has made it such a unique design in favor of streamlining it. There's not a problem with that. The symmetry looks great, it looks beautiful, but the end result somehow looks bland to the eye. And I hate to use the word uninspired because as we can see, tons of inspiration went into this piece. The things to like, the handset with the plots and the polished frames around them look great. That inner white ring looks fantastic. It offers a unique and also great dynamic to what could be seen as a cookie cutter design otherwise. And if I'm not mistaken, this inner ring distinctly belongs to Breitling and has ties to some of the earliest super oceans. But I think what would have benefited this watch a lot, not major tweaks, just making the bezel and the dial matte in finish. It would have communicated a far more professional look, but also give the plots and the hands great light play. And we should also note that dive watches from that time, you know, the late 60s and 70s, would have predominantly been matte finished, obviously to aid in legibility. The bonuses about this model is it has been streamlined everywhere. The case profile is thinner, the bracelet has been improved, it has an amazing micro-adjusting clasp system. And in typical Breitling fashion, so many good options for size and color choices. And it needs to also be said, value for money. You are getting a quality product here. But for the life of me, I cannot understand this watch. You know, it rides this fine line of being safe in design, but also trying to be out there as a flagship model. It's a beautiful looking watch, don't get me wrong, but there's nothing about it that defines it, that really makes it stand out. There's no spark. Maybe this would have come across better as a diving chronograph like the original, providing a few more features, a bit more bang per buck. And having this as an alternative diving chrono, it becomes a reason why people would go after a watch like this instead of a Seamaster Planet Ocean Black Bay Seiko Prospects. I honestly don't know how to address this design to improve it, to alter it. I've spent a lot of time manipulating it, but I still can't seem to get anything right. It's extremely difficult to put an idea like this in a box. Is it modern? Is it modern that's leaning too close to being vintage? This feels exactly the same as my Tudor Ranger critique, and like the Ranger, it bothers me to say that a product comes across as good and not great. And it shows that we enthusiasts are hard to please at the best of times. Where I can commend this brand is that they are not creating an out-and-out -out reissue. You know, a one-to-one -one scale model that has all the classic proportions, the equivalent of the past model. There's no faux patina on the dial and all the rest. This one rather borrows from some of those old core aesthetics and moves it on as a modern concept. You know, with everything that I've said here, this watch does scream Super Ocean. And what they have managed to do here is create a piece that has a modern stance by using past inspirations in their arsenal, and maybe all this piece needs, the removing of crown guards, a matte finish on the bezel and dial, and a fully graduated bezel insert. Nothing too crazy. The end of the story is that this piece does not appeal to me, but it should not deter you. This watch is excellent value for money, like I said. It's built like a tank, and houses so much distinctive Breitling DNA. I mean, it has it all. And you really can't ask for more. I just find it a bit baffling that a new example of the Super Ocean is trying to find its footing and identity and in the process is creating a model, trying to fuse heritage with modern, but giving us an in-between. At the same time, it's trying to follow many current trends. But the net result is its design feels almost too safe, to a point where it almost looks indecisive. And I feel that all that Breitling needs to find is that distinctive grounding point, something that truly defines the Super Ocean line. And once they land on it, It'll make all the difference.